people don't understand, and I prosecuted these cases, dead people vote all the time. Madam Speaker, you have heard me say on occasion that the right to vote is precious, almost sacred. In a democratic society, it is the most powerful, non-violent instrument or tool that we have. Many people marched, protested for the right to vote. Some gave a little blood, others gave their very lives. The Madam Speaker, you have heard me tell the story before, and you know our work is not finished. It makes me sad. It makes me feel like crying when people are denied the right to vote. So I ask you, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Let's save our nation and redeem time has expired. the soul of America. Thank you very much. Since the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, much of the country has come together during this time of divide and isolation. In this urgent moment of national reckoning, the mission and purpose of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Equal Justice Initiative have never been more important. These two organizations have worked tirelessly to end police violence, shape the public narrative on civil rights and racial discrimination, guarantee equal access to education and employment, and fight systemic inequities and continue to plague so many people of color. As difficult as this period has been, it has also brought millions of Americans closer to understanding the deep flaws in our democracy and to committing themselves to working to end the inequalities and systemic injustices that have left our democracy so vulnerable. That brings us to tonight's conversation. With less than two weeks left in this contentious and important election, we will hear from two of the nation's leading civil rights attorneys and leaders, both fighting to defend our nation's democracy and battle racial injustice. Sherilyn Eiffel is the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the nation's premier civil rights law organization fighting for racial justice and equality. LDF was founded in 1940 by legendary civil rights lawyer and later Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and became a separate organization from the NAACP in 1957. LDF has argued over 700 cases before the United States Supreme Court. As LDF's seventh director counsel and the second woman to lead the organization, Eiffel has increased the visibility and engagement of the organization in cutting edge and urgent civil rights issues while maintaining the organization's decades long leadership. Eiffel is also a prolific scholar who has published academic articles in leading law journals, op-eds, and commentaries in leading newspapers. Her 2007 book, On the Courthouse Lawn, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century, was highly acclaimed and is credited with laying the foundation for contemporary conversations about lynching and reconciliation. A 10th anniversary edition of the book was recently released with a foreword by Brian Stevenson. At critical moments during national unrest following the killing of unarmed African-Americans by law enforcement officers, Eiffel's voice and vision framed the issue of policing reform and urban deprivation with powerful clarity in media appearances and public discussions. Just last week, Eiffel was named one of Glamour's 2020 Women of the Year, and last month she was profiled by ta Coates in the September issue of Vanity Fair. Brian Stevenson is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, a human rights organization in Montgomery, Alabama. Stevenson is a widely acclaimed public interest lawyer who has dedicated his career to helping the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned. Stevenson and his staff at EJI have won reversals, relief, or release from prison for over 135 wrongly condemned prisoners on death row and one relief for hundreds of others wrongly convicted or unfairly sentenced. Stevenson has argued and won multiple cases at the US Supreme Court, including a 2019 ruling protecting condemned prisoners who suffer from dementia and a landmark 2012 ruling that banned mandatory life without parole sentences for all children 17 or younger. 
Stevenson has also led the creation of two highly acclaimed cultural sites, which opened in 2018, the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. The two national landmark institutions chronicle the legacy of slavery, lynching, and racial segregation, and the connection to mass incarceration and contemporary issues of racial bias. Stevenson's work has won him numerous awards, including over 40 honorary doctorates, the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Prize, and the ABA Medal, the American Bar Association's highest honor. He is also the author of the award-winning New York Times bestseller, Just Mercy, which was recently adapted as a major motion picture. Now, please join me in welcoming Sherilyn Eiffel and Brian Stevenson. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you all for joining us tonight for this conversation. Um, and I must extend my thanks to the staff of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Equal Justice Initiative for organizing this evening. Hi, Brian. Hey, Sherilyn. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. So listen, let me explain to those of you who are watching um, a little bit about uh, this conversation and then we'll jump right into it. Um, you know, Brian and I have not often spoken together in public. We've done it a few times, but we speak quite frequently uh, in private. And um, it occurred to us that it might be interesting for us to have that conversation out in front of all of you. So there's no moderator tonight. We're gonna have the kind of conversation that he and I have from time to time when we're wrestling with and trying to figure out how to do the work that we do, how to stay focused, how to stay encouraged, and how to strategize through very difficult times. I think it goes without saying that this is one of the most difficult moments that we have faced in this country, certainly in the context of civil rights and racial justice. Um, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that this is one of the most challenging periods of many generations, and that what hangs in the balance is the very integrity of our democracy at this moment. Now, Brian and I both lead nonpartisan organizations, so we don't shill for political parties, and so you won't hear that tonight. What we are committed to is racial justice and equality, and we tell the truth about it, um, no matter who we need to talk about. Uh, and so you'll hear some of that tonight as well. And I'm so glad that Brian was willing to have this conversation because we are just uh, a few weeks out from election day. We're not a few weeks out from the election. The election is happening. Nearly 40 million votes have already been cast in this general election. The election is not only for the president, it's for seats uh, on the Senate in 34 states, but it's also for all those races, for all of those offices that matter, district attorneys, sheriffs, school boards, judges, railroad commissioners. And we wanna encourage everyone to vote the entire ballot. Uh, if you have the opportunity to vote early, vote early um, and make sure that your voice counts. So we're gonna just back and forth for a little bit and we haven't really prepped very much. We prepped a little bit, but it could go anywhere is what I'm trying to say. We're just gonna have the conversation. So Brian, I'm gonna start by asking the question that I think you know is the one we kind of need to wrestle with first, which is like, how do you or how are you diagnosing this moment? In other words, what you know, some people say we have entered the nadir. Some people say this is the last gasp of white supremacy. Uh, you know, how are you describing or how are you thinking in your head about this moment, and how do you put it in context historically and otherwise um, as you try to kind of navigate your way through the work during this incredibly difficult time? For me, I think we are finally recognizing that the issues we have in this country are deep and complex and that the kind of superficial solutions that people have been proposing for a really long time are gonna be inadequate. Um, I think our long history of racial inequality has created a kind of smog that has polluted the environment and it doesn't matter whether you live in California or Mississippi or Minnesota New Hampshire, we're all burdened by this toxic environment created by this long history of racial inequality. And Sherilyn, you and I have heard for most of our lives that that stuff will just dissipate. If we just wait long enough, it'll eventually go away. And I think what we now realize is that the kind of toxins we are dealing with are not going to just, we're going to actually have to do some things to clean this environment, to clean this air, and what worries me is that we that we haven't created the resolve 
uh, in every sector to make that kind of engagement. Um, we're going to have to do really difficult things over the next couple of decades. This is a 400 year problem. It's not just a month. We can't just pass one law mm -hmm. and just elect one person. 12 years ago, you and I were constantly being asked, aren't we post-racial now in America? Yes. It was frustrating to both of us because it seems so disconnected from this long history. And I think the encouraging thing about this moment is that many more people are now reckoning that we have a cancer. And this cancer will not go away without a very kind of invasive, important treatment. We're going to have to go through the chemotherapy of truth telling. We're going to have to go through uh, the really difficult process of, of dealing with this long history and the multiple manifestations of it. And that means that our work is just beginning and we're nowhere near the finish line of the kind of work that has to happen. People can say, when are we going to be tired with racial justice, uh, done with racial justice work? We're just starting with the kind of work that I think we both recognize is long overdue. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And in fact, I think that um, this moment where what, what we're seeing is really an effort to create an infrastructure of minority rule, you know, racial minority rule um, that would carry on in perpetuity is really the alarm bell that we needed because you're absolutely right. Um, you know, when um, uh, Barack Obama was elected president, I think people thought, we had come to a place where now the stuff that we had to do was not going to be that difficult, right? We had crossed some important threshold and that we couldn't go back, right? And now we were going to be able to kind of solve these problems. But, you know, as you and I very often discuss, that, you know, if you looked beneath that surface, you know, it was very thin on the top in terms of how we were engaging issues of race. And when I say to people, you know, who are so distressed about the moment that we're in now, and I'm distressed about it too, don't get me wrong. And in a minute, we should talk about what makes this moment different, you know, than what we've seen in the past. Um, you know, people have almost forgotten. I said, well, when, well, you know, when did, when did Ferguson happen? You know, when, when did we see Walter Scott running in that park being shot by a police officer in the back. Uh, we had we had a black president when that happened, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so it was very apparent that the problems were still there and that they were in quite, in, in quite deep indeed and quite um, intransigent. And so I think people just wanted to believe that things could go more smoothly uh, than they need to go. Now you describe this as a cancer that requires the chemotherapy of, of truth telling, which I just love writing that down. Um, I often talk about it as rot at the foundation and how we have to put our hard hats on. That's how I talk about civil rights work, you know, that, that we're democracy maintenance workers and we put our hard hats on and we get and we have to dig out. And sometimes there's real rot in the foundation. And if you find rot in the foundation, you know, you got to dig it all out. You can't just paper it over. Right. And spackle it. Um, but in, but in any case, we have to get in there and get the stuff out. What's the stuff yeah. that we have to get out in, yeah. in your view? Yeah, I, I think it's stuff that we've just never acknowledged. So, I mean, I think about the history of this country. We're a post-genocide society. When Europeans came to this continent, we slaughtered millions of indigenous people. It was, an, it was a genocide. We killed them through famine and war and disease. And we never acknowledged the violence of that invasion. We uh, took their land, we kept their words, we made the people leave, and we never really addressed it. And to justify it, we created this narrative of racial difference. And that narrative of racial difference is at the heart of that rot. It's what's created the rot. Because it's that narrative of racial difference that caused us to create this constitution that talked about equality and justice for all, and then not extend those protections and lofty ideas to the majority population on this continent who were native people, indigenous people. And it was that narrative that then allowed us to traffic millions of black people to this continent. We enslaved black people for two and a half centuries. And I don't think we've acknowledged that the great evil of slavery wasn't the involuntary servitude. It wasn't the forced labor, but it was this idea that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people are less deserving, black people are less human, black people are less capable, black people are less worthy. That idea that narrative of racial difference, that false ideology of white supremacy, that was the real evil. And we fought the Civil War, and you heard me say that the South, won, uh, the North won the Civil War, but the South won the narrative war because that idea of white supremacy prevailed. Even abolitionists didn't believe in racial equality, many of them. And so after the, the, uh, the Civil War, we then entered into this new era. We passed a constitutional amendment to provide the right to vote to black men and equal protection but we didn't enforce it because we weren't committed to eradicating that white supremacy. And then we see a hundred years 
of terrorism and violence. And you researched this work where black people were pulled out of their homes and beaten and drowned and tortured and lynched as you write, on the courthouse law, and it was lawlessness. Our legal institutions didn't respond. Our government institutions didn't respond. Noble people didn't respond. Church people didn't respond. And then we get into the civil rights era, and we have this courageous movement by courageous Black people who put on their Sunday best. They go to places. Uh, they deal down and pray. They are battered and beaten and bruised and bloodied, and yet they go. We pass the civil rights laws. We pass uh, the voting rights laws, but the narrative of racial difference, the ideology of white supremacy persists. And you and I grew up at a time where despite the Civil Rights Act and despite the Voting Rights Act, we still have to navigate these presumptions of unworthiness, of dangerousness, of guilt. I, I've, I've tell people, I, I argued these cases at the U.S. Supreme Court. I'd argued a case uh, creating rights for children. I was going around the country defending young kids in courtrooms across America. And I was in the Midwest. I had my suit and tie on, got there early. I never want to create any bad vibe in court. You know what that's about. Mm -hmm. Sitting there at defense counsel's table and had the judge walk in and, and see me there and get angry and say, hey, hey, you get back out there in the hallway. You wait until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And then I have to stand up and apologize and say, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevens and I am the lawyer. And the judge starts laughing and the prosecutor starts laughing and I make myself laugh because I don't want my client who is more vulnerable to be a punish for my reaction to their bigotry. And so the client comes in, we do the hearing, but I have to tell you, you know, when you finish a hearing like that and you're sitting in your car and you're thinking about the fact that you're a middle-aged black man with all these degrees, with all of this experience, and you're still required to laugh at your own humiliation, you realize that this fundamental problem in America can no longer be ignored. That is the rot, our silence, our indifference, our unwillingness to talk about these structural and systemic problems. And that's why I believe we have to have a whole era of truth and justice, truth and repair, truth and reconciliation, truth and restoration. We can't fix this in a year. It won't be over in December. And no matter what the outcome of this election, we've got a whole era of work to do. And I think that's what we have to orient people to. Yeah, so let me let me try to break this down into two pieces that I definitely want to talk about because, you know, obviously, you know that I believe and I've, you know, written extensively about the need for us to confront the reality first of all of our history of the brutality of white supremacy, of what it did to uh, black communities, of what it did to white people who have taken on this cloak of silence and who have uh, joined this complicity. And I believe, as you believe, that we have to break down these narratives. Um, and in fact, I believe that one of the mistakes that we made after the civil rights movement was that we believed we had won the narrative war yeah. because you know we had this wonderful and truly extraordinary story you just described it of you know ordinary people of of activists putting their lives on the line to transform their communities and the result of what they did made america better made america have a narrative about itself that sounded kind of good now america could describe itself as a place of equality and opportunity yeah and had gone through this civil rights movement and everything was covered in this wonderful sepia color. And now you could you know, have these wonderful days that were devoted to lifting up heroes and, and, and all of that happened. And I think people thought we had won the narrative war, but I believe that you never win the narrative. You have to keep working on the narrative. And we saw very quickly by the time we were at 1980, the reversal of the narrative. Now we had the welfare queen, right? Now we had all of these re you know, reverse discrimination uh, to, to describe affirmative action. All of this language that actually was being created, developed and perpetuated by those who were working in opposition to racial equality and actually they were owning the narrative really for most of the 80s yeah. and into the 90s, right? Yeah. And I think that our failure to recognize that we, and, and I'm now I'm saying we, I'm talking about you know civil rights lawyers, believed because of the tremendous success of organizations like the Legal Defense Fund, of Thurgood Marshall, that winning in the courtroom was vitally important, but we didn't attend enough to the fact that you have to also keep moving that narrative forward. But the reason I, 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 I wanna hesitate here also is because I think sometimes when we talk about narrative, it sounds a little bit to people like we're not doing the work of transformation in terms of the material condition of people's lives. And this um, I think has to be said and it has to be understood that we don't mean 
you know, we want to stop trying to actually um, protect people and make sure people have a chance and an opportunity so we can have a lot of conversations. Because I know that that is sometimes what people think and it's and, and I understand people's impatience with it, because that's definitely not what I mean. Um, yeah. And I think the work we both do is very directly work that is involved with transforming the lives. Yes, it is work focused on structural inequality, but that structural inequality that we're challenging is so that people can have um, you know, a life that allows them to have opportunity, that, that allows them to have dignity and that protects them and so forth. Yeah. And so I do think it's very important as we as we have this conversation about narrative that we be talking about these two things at once because people are tired. People do not want to wait. One of the great yeah. things about having um, mass movements, particularly mass movements led by young people, and you know that, you know, you and I are not old, but we are not young. We've been around <laughs> And you know that people constantly try to get older civil rights uh, activists or leaders to throw shade on young people. Mm. And you know, it's, it's all, sometimes it's a little subtle, but they kind of want you to throw shade. And I, don't, and I won't participate in it, right? I always say like, I, you know, there, is, there are components to this thing. Just like I don't believe that litigation is everything, being in the courtroom, I believe you have to have activism. I believe you have to have culture and art, that these are all the pieces that yeah. help this transformation and change happen. But what I do hear sometimes from young people is that impatience. And I believe that's the role that young people play so powerfully is that they are impatient, is that that's they nudge right. us to try to move faster. Because the truth is we, we understand, we begin to understand the system and we know it's a long game and everything you said is right, that we gotta you know, play this game long, but they're also impatient. And it's in those moments when there is impatience that we make you know, the moves forward in a very quick way. And that this is, this is all fits and spurts, right? Yeah. You, know, you have these periods in which you move forward and then you have these periods of retrenchment. People talk about the civil rights movement as though you know, it was it was like a year or two. I mean, we're really talking about, well, if we begin with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, 1955, uh, Emmett Till is lynched, 1956, Rosa Parks won't give up her seat on the bus, 1957, we have the creation of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and on and on, right? And it ends basically uh, around 1968 with the assassination of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, and then the passage of the Fair Housing Act passed by one vote in Congress in shame a week after Martin Luther King is assassinated as cities all over the country are burning. So you're basically talking about some, you know, something like 15 years, right, mm -hmm. of a period. And people should understand that, I think, in this moment, when yeah. people are seeing all the activism that's happened since George Floyd was killed, which is actually the activism that begins when Eric Garner is killed in 2014 in New York, right? So that's already five years, right? So when people say, well, is this a civil rights movement? You know, the, the you may be in it and not realize it. It's not like people were walking around in 1960 saying, wow, we're in the civil rights movement. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, it's something you look back on. There are these periods though, when when transformation, big transformation can happen. And I think it's it's the moments that you described earlier, which is, when so many more people begin to see that something much deeper than they imagined before is happening and requires a much deeper solution. Yeah. And so yeah. at some point, I mean, I'm gonna just be quiet for a second, but I, I need us to begin to talk a little bit about the method that you and I have chosen to do this work, which is to work through the legal system. Which yeah. I think, you know. Yeah, no, but I, I, I could not agree more, Sherilyn. And I do think that it's worth um, acknowledging the critical role that young people play. I mean, you know, we just put up a new exhibit in our museum on the Montgomery bus boycott. And it's astonishing when you think about Dr. King standing up in front of hundreds of people who've come together for the first time in the history of this state to organize a protest. He's 26 years old. You know, people forget that, the, that it was young people in the 1950s and 60s. Older people got involved too, uh, but they had this... And so we have to affirm that. But I do think the question you pose is a really important question. This intersection between law and narrative and patience. I think we should be impatient because I think our impatience will ask us, cause us to ask questions that we haven't asked before. Like, how do we repair the kind of damage that has been done by a long history? I mean, if I could, you know, if we could go back to the 1950s and 60s and and we had the resources that we have now, I think we would actually be demanding different things. One of the things that is really bizarre to me, and both you and I have taught in law schools, when you go to law school, the law school curriculum is dominated 
by courses that talk about remedies. Uh, you know, contracts, most of, the, most of the classwork is about remedies for what happens when you violate a contract, remedies for what happens when you commit a tort, remedies for tax violations, remedies for property. We're, we're preoccupied with how do we fix the problems created when the law is broken. Working in the criminal justice system, it's all about remediating someone's behavior. If I represent somebody who's committed three burglaries, I can't go to court and have my client say, oh, your honor, I'm not gonna commit no more burglaries and that be it. Mm -hmm. But somehow in the civil rights context, we've created a frame where those who violate civil rights are only required to kind of say they won't do it again. Kind of, kind of. And, and the American South, you're right, they didn't even say that. <laughs> Alabama didn't say we're not going to ever violate Black people's rights to vote. Mississippi didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't even have an expectation that there be repair for a century of disenfranchisement. And the absence of that conversation is what gave rise to this reaction that was rooted in the same resistance uh, to enforcing civil rights that existed beforehand. And I just think that has to change. And people have heard me say this and they think I'm joking. And I'm only kind of joking, but I actually think it would have been legitimate in 1965 after the passage of the Voting Rights Act uh, for the government to demand that states like my state of Alabama that had disenfranchised people for a century to demand that they automatically register every black person. Mm -hmm. What would have been wrong with that? Why not? insist on automatic registration of black people. We know the state has been trying to disenfranchise black people for a century. Why not insist on providing educational opportunities for black kids at colleges and universities that are more advantageous than white kids? Why not insist on that? And I actually think if we had 50 years of automatic registration of black people, of accommodating black voters, we'd be in a very different place in this country when it comes to the issues that you and I are talking about. But because we didn't do that, we had an intense resistance we're fighting the same battles that they were fighting 60 years ago. And those battles will continue until we think differently about the kind of remediation, the kind of repair, the kind of accountability. You know, we come from a faith tradition, you know, in our church, if somebody comes in and says, I want salvation and redemption, but I don't want to talk about nothing bad. I don't want to own up to nothing. You know, our preachers are going to say it don't work like that. You can't get the salvation and redemption until you confess and repent. And they encourage us to see that confession and repentance isn't a bad thing. It's a process that leads to something better. And what I genuinely believe is that there is something better waiting for us in this country. There's something that feels more like equality and freedom and justice waiting for all of us. But we're not going to get there if we try to avoid accountability, avoid responsibility, avoid confession and apology, avoid the effort at repair. And that's where I think the legal effort has to shift along with the activism effort that we create different expectations, different yeah. demands for those who violate civil rights as they are doing right now. Well, and, and not just individually, right? So, you know, there, there, I am frankly most interested in institutional accountability. And even, you know, when I wrote my book about lynching, one of the reasons why I was so uh, taken with the South African Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission process wasn't actually because of the individual hearings about you know individual uh, acts of inhumanity that had happened. Those were incredibly compelling and powerful and important. But I actually ended up spending most of my time really studying um, what has gotten not as much attention: uh, the institutional hearings. Yeah. You know, when the media had to come come to account and acknowledge the role it played in perpetuating apartheid. Right when the judges. Hear me now. When the judges, by the way, none of whom showed up at the at the at the commission hearing about judges, but when the judicial system, right, when they had those hearings to to probe and examine and acknowledge the ways in which judges had contributed to the apartheid system and to the humanity of apartheid, when they looked at the church, the Dutch Reformed Church, and so forth. Those institutional hearings for me were the template for what I think is really missing from our conversation. And, and the perfect example is just really interesting because we just filed suit today against HUD um, to, to push back against the efforts of this administration to weaken the Fair Housing Act and to get rid of disparate impact and so forth. And, and it's worth just talking about like housing for a second because this president is the first president in my lifetime who explicitly talks about wanting segregation. Right. He says, you know, uh, we're going to protect your communities from 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 Senator Cory Booker, you know, uh, white suburban women. You want me to protect uh, in our lifetime. I mean, maybe like Lester Maddox and George Wallace, <laughs> the president. We had a president really called to 
a period of housing segregation. And so it's worth talking about why is he talking about it, right? Yeah. And that is one of the circumstances in which I think your point about we're not gonna do it anymore was just completely insufficient. Now, by the time we got to 1968, even among some of the most well-meaning allies, a lot of the energy around civil rights had petered out. And of course, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King you know, was, was, was devastating, followed by the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. And I do think there's a trauma there that needs to be unpacked as yeah. well. Uh, but 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 the truth is that you know this country was basically built the physical landscape was built on a doctrine of white supremacy and segregation and i'm not talking about the 1800s i'm not talking about the 1900s i'm talking about in the 20th century and as you and i both know much of this was the result of federal government policy People like to think about housing discrimination in the individual sense. And of course, there was that too. Uh, you know, Donald Trump and his dad are, of course, uh, a, a famous example sued by the Department of Justice for not allowing black people to live in their apartments in, in Queens, putting a C on applications for colored of black people and keeping them. That is one form that's a pernicious form of discrimination meant to be addressed by the Fair Housing Act. But there's the structural part of it that's important. It's all of the money that the federal government poured into ensuring that there would be the creation of the white middle class, especially after the Second World War. The GI Bill, the tax breaks to create whites only suburbs like Levittown, the billions of dollars invested in the interstate highway system, which really allowed for the creation of the white suburbs. It definitely wasn't for the creation of the of black suburbs. All of those investments allowed white people to make a move, people who had not been in the middle class, very quickly into the middle class and to be able to own homes that had value and that appreciated in value, which is the, you know, the way in which black people think about and all people in America think about the, the building of initial wealth, which is you know, owning property. So at some point when we get to the Fair Housing Act in 1968, basically we just, we just say, well, stop doing the things you were doing before. We don't take account of the unequal economic condition in which black and white families find themselves as a result of the federal government to whom we all pay taxes, making massive investments in the creation and solidifying of a white middle class at the expense of a black community. So this suggests exactly what you're talking about, that the remedies we seek in the civil rights context have to include a remedy that takes account of the damage that was done and that attempts to repair that damage rather than simply says, now we know that that was bad and we're gonna do something different. So yeah. that's kind of a bit of an onus on us as lawyers, right? To be that's thinking right. about those remedies. That's right, because we can identify the banks that were complicit in facilitating the wealth gap that we still see today. We can identify those banks. We know who the black veterans are who went to, uh, to Europe, uh, that went to Korea and fought in the World War II and the Korean, we know who they are. We know who applied for mortgages and loans and were denied because banks wouldn't give money to black veterans to live in these segregated areas. And we can identify the children and grandchildren of those people. And I actually think it's not too late to demand that those banks acknowledge the role they played in facilitating the wealth gaps that we see in America today. And to be thinking about how we're going to repair that damage. I don't think it's too late. And again, I think we have to create a culture, a political environment, a social environment that doesn't look at that repair as a burden, but looks at it as a kind of a way to move forward. You know, you talked about South Africa and, and I just, you know, I, you know, I've been to Berlin and what's interesting to me about Germany is that it took a while, but you look at the architecture in that city, you can't go 200 meters in Berlin without seeing markers and stones that have been placed next to the homes of Jewish families. The taxi cab drivers and the hotel operators encourage you to go to the center to see the Holocaust Memorial, there is a reckoning with that history. They are anxious for people to know that they are trying to address the pain and anguish and trauma created by the Holocaust. There are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. It would be unconscionable for somebody in Germany to say, oh, let's honor the architects. Or, or, or Goring or Goebbels or any of the others either. I mean, absolutely. It, That's right. it, but here I am. Yeah. Here I am yeah. living in Alabama in a place where the landscape is littered with yes. the iconography of the Confederacy, where people actually uh, get angry if you try to suggest it's inappropriate to honor the architects. And that consciousness has got to change as we begin to implement these, implement these kinds of remedies that are so critical to the material repair that you and I were talking about earlier that has to go along with the narrative constructs that help us get to a better place. Yeah, what, what I think the two things come together. 
what, one of the reasons I love the monument conversation is because I am kind of obsessed with the physical landscape. It goes along with the segregation piece because you know so much of, of what we think of as white supremacy was understood in physical terms. You know, it's the water fountains that say colored and say white, and people understand when they see that what that means. You know, it's the waiting room at the bus station. Uh, it's the colored only signs and so forth that people really understand. Um, and yet now, now that the signs have been removed, it's as though people can't see that the markers are still there, but there's still the physical structure, right? We just assume that black people live on the South side, right? right. We, we don't even talk about, well, how did they end up there, right? We don't talk about those things. We just assume that these that this was given to us and that it was inevitable. Yeah. And it's not. it was not inevitable. It was created by government policies and practices that assigned places where black people could live that were substandard, that were not regarded at that moment as the best places. Later on, there's gentrification, and sometimes they came back and decided that maybe that was a nice place, and then they wanted us out of there. But all of those things are intentional. And so I'm, I mean, the only, the only um, footnote I would just give, or, or adjustment I would give to your, the, your conception of, you know, finding the veterans and so forth, is I really believe that institutional um, wrongdoing requires institutional ac accountability. Yeah. And while I believe in individual reparations, I believe that institutional accountability is important. I want to know what is the public infrastructure equivalent of the interstate highway that would support the strengthening and development of black communities. I want to know what is what are the investments that we can be making. And, and that I always say that, you know, policy decisions are basically investment decisions. What are the decisions that we can be making that can have that kind of broad based deep transformational potential as because people some they figured it out they figured out how to make a yeah. white middle class yeah, so obviously yeah. you can it's something you can make you can actually make it i mean that's exciting news you could you know they figured out what the formula was and they did it and so yeah. if you could figure out the formula for that in the 1940s you could figure out the formula for that now now i want to push us to get to our profession for a second yeah. and to because you just said something important about, you know, what we have to be asking for, what we have to be demanding as lawyers. And, you know, you have heard my, um, they're, you know, becoming screeds um, about, about our prof profession because, look, to be a civil rights lawyer requires you to suspend disbelief, right? You just described a, a pretty um, distressing and harrowing scene that you, faced in a courtroom, right? In which a judge presumed that you were the defendant and not the lawyer, right? And, and as you said, you had to kind of go along and, 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 and laugh, you know, because you represent somebody and you, you're you trying to, you, we always are trying to keep the focus off us. Yeah. I often tell the story of Thurgood Marshall, you know, litigating uh, the case challenging segregation at University of Oklahoma Law School with his client, Ada Sippowell Fisher, and, you know, them finishing up the first day and, and, and being so hungry, you know, starving basically. And the reason was because they didn't realize that they weren't going to be able to eat in the courthouse where they were litigating this case, which later went to the Supreme Court and where they were successful. And at the end of the first day, I had a conversation, a phone conversation with Ada Sippowell Fisher before she passed away. And she said that Marshall said to her as they were packing up at the end of the day, well, tomorrow I'll try the case and you bring the bologna sandwiches. You know? <laughs> So it's nice. It's you know, it's almost like you you know, you have to laugh, right? But there it is, because it does require us to to work through a system that we know is deeply flawed, right? Has its own deeply entrenched racism, and to manipulate that system, right? To try and achieve an outcome for our clients, and when we do it successfully, you know, it's kismet. It is fantastic. It's amazing. But our profession also has some responsibilities because people let lawyers be leaders all the time, whether yeah. they deserve it or not. You know, it's and it's it's no mistake that all over the, you know, it's Gandhi, it's Nelson Mandela. It's no, it's no surprise that that many people who have been at the forefront of transformative movements are have also been lawyers. Uh, but our profession in this country gives lawyers a lot of power and a lot of voice. And I have been deeply distressed at what I regard, uh, particularly during this period over the last four years, as the failures of our profession to hold to a particular standard. Did I ever believe I would see 30 judicial nominees uh, testify before the Senate um, ju uh, Judiciary Committee and refuse to say that Brown versus Board of Education was correctly decided? Um, you know, when I, when I see what has been happening to the rule of law in this country, and I see the um, 
the, the silence of our profession as we hear things that would have been impossible to imagine that you can simply defy a subpoena. You could decide you're just not gonna show up because you don't want to, um, yeah. because the president told you not to. Um, all of these things, that the, the twisting of what executive privilege is, the pretending that we don't know what witness intimidation is, when some of the, the texts and tweets that we have seen, if, that, if, that, if we had seen those in the context of a trial here in Baltimore against a gang leader, and you know, and they said you should check out his father-in-law. We would know that that was an effort to try to intimidate somebody, right? But all of a sudden, you know, pundits going on and on, and lawyers saying, "I wonder, do we think, you know, what could this be? Was there collusion? All of these questions that, if they were your clients, uh, Brian, you know exactly how it would go, and you know the inferences would never go in their favor. And yet, largely as a profession, our profession has been silent and i would have refused to be silent about it because um because we are part of this profession yeah and yeah. because frankly the work of civil rights lawyers has elevated this profession yeah. has made this profession a noble one has made it cool to be a lawyer to be frank i've always said it was not cool to be a lawyer until thurgood marshall had that trench coat on and the cigarette <laughs> and, you know and, and spoke with a normal person right you know <laughs> Civil rights lawyers gave something to this profession and this profession owes it to yeah. stand up for those principles. Now, many you know, are doing great work. We have law firms that wanna do pro bono and so forth, but that's not quite the same as what I'm talking about. That's right. I'm talking about when you have judicial nominees who refuse to say the Brown versus Board of Education, where is there a professional institutional response to that? And I just didn't hear it and didn't see it. And so I've been calling it out. And yeah. so just because you and I are lawyers in this profession, because we've chosen this, because to do this work means you have to kind of believe in it. And frankly, you know, one of the things I always felt was that we are in role in this profession and everybody's doing their, their job, but that we are united at least by a respect for the rule of law and by an understanding of the importance of the rule of law to a democracy. What I have seen over the last three years has really shaken me to the core and it's made me angry. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't been hiding it. I've been very explicit about it. And I'm just curious about how have you been kind of navigating yeah. this? Well, I, I think, Sherilyn, the advocacy you've been doing on this issue has been so critical. It's been so important because people do have to speak out about that. This is one of those times, you know, Ms. Parks and those folks used to say to me, sometimes you have to stand up when people say, sit down. Sometimes you have to speak when people say be quiet. On this issue of the institutional integrity of the legal profession and our commitment to be guardians of the rule of law in a democracy, uh, you're absolutely right. And I think the advocacy you've been doing and, and a handful of others is so critical because it is this institution that's gonna to have to be at the heart of whether we succeed or fail in the coming years. No matter what happens with this election, there is still gonna be a need for accountability for those who have undermined the integrity and commitment to the rule of law. Listen, when the courts uh, facilitate inequality, segregation, bigotry, discrimination, there's no hope for the institutions outside the court. That's what was so corrupt about the way in which we looked away from the disparities based on race. The way we... And so there is important work. And I think we have to all be pushing the legal profession uh, to stop being so indifferent to these judges that are saying things that are hostile to uh, the integrity of the rule of law. You know, we have traditions in the, in the law now, there's some things we're really clear about, you know, taking money from clients and uh, inappropriate more, but we're real clear about that. And, and, and very few people can avoid consequences for that. But I want to at least contend that when we are tolerating bigotry and discrimination, when we're allowing people to express contempt for civil rights, and the basic dignity of all people, when we shroud police and prosecutors and judges with immunity that shields them from accountability, we become complicit in the destruction of respect for the rule of law. And that has to change. And again, there, I think we have to ask for more. Mm -hmm. And the reason why some of us are calling for an end to qualified immunity for police officers isn't because we hate the police, it's because we think that no one with power and responsibility uh, should be free from the obligation to exercise that power responsibly. There's not a coach in America that can coach a college football team and lose every game and expect never to be held accountable despite their losses. You and I are accountable, right? Uh, 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 
investors are uncountable, business leaders, why are we not allowing police officers and prosecutors, that's the part of it that we don't talk about either. That's right. We got that's thousands right. of innocent people in our jails and prisons. And we have a system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. And prosecutors aren't held accountable for their role in facilitating these kinds of horrific outcomes. And that has to change. And I actually think lawyers and the legal profession, the American Bar Association, uh, cool bar our, our, top, our top law firms. I mean, this is this top is, and this is not about pro bono. This is about the heart and soul yes. of the rule of law and of the legal profession. Yes, and 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 we have to take responsibility for it. You know, qualified immunity is not in the Constitution. You know, that, it, was, it was created. It's it's not something that came down on some tablets. Yes, and so when we see, uh, you know, I remember this, um, Brian. This was after um, what I what I think of as the worst. 48 hours uh, since I since I led the Legal Defense Fund, and it was the the 48 hours in which um, there were two killings of um, uh, by police officers of, of innocent black men, um, one in Baton Rouge and then um, Philando Castile in Minnesota. Like 48 hours later, um, and then there was a shooting of two police officers in Dallas, and so it was a very volatile time. And President Obama had a meeting at the White House of you know all kinds of stakeholders, and it was a really powerful meeting. Yeah. Talk about that another time. Endless admiration for the way the, pre the president of the United States ran a meeting for four hours. No notes, no, no yeah. staff helping him, but listening and speaking. And I remember saying at that meeting, you all, and I was talking to the, you know, the police leaders and the prosecutors and su such who were present, you are making me look ridiculous. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm a civil rights lawyer. So I'm, I'm always trying to fix the system, trying to make it work, right? And to suggest that we should always try to make it work, but it's got to work sometime, right? Yeah. It can't be that, they, that everybody gets off. It can, I mean, can you point me to some of can I get a few cases? I mean, at that point, it's just crazy. And we have to take responsibility as a profession for whatever we created that contributes to injustice. Yes. And that's how I see the qualified immunity issue. It is created by judges. It is um, ma maintained by lawyers. And we know that it is contributing to gross injustice in the system. And so it's our responsibility to affirmatively yeah. address it and deal with it. Um, and so when I, I just think at this moment, it's important to call these things out because there's so much work to be done, regardless of the outcome of this election, that, that we, there are fundamental institutional issues that we all have to take responsibility for if we're to transform this country into the country we want it to be. Now, I want to make sure I have the opportunity to give us a moment to talk about the South. Yeah. Because you and I have often been in meetings. I, I try not to be in your line of sight when we're in meetings because bad <laughs> things happen. But often we are in meetings and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And people will start telling us about some innovative, wonderful racial and justice initiative that happened in Seattle or um you know or right am i right or aspen yes. or something right and you and i keep looking and i and i know you what you're going to say and so i start <laughs> kind of looking down writing in my book and then you you start saying okay but let's talk about alabama <laughs> right? and so you know 90 percent of the work of ldf is in the south i think people forget that that a majority of black people still live in the south i love to see the work of people like latasha brown and others who are just demanding that we be attentive to the South and you are based in Alabama. And um, I wanna talk a little bit, just to give your sense of just a kind of prognosis of what you think are the key issues that we should be focused on in the South at this moment. Yeah, well, I mean, you know them well. Uh, first of all, voting, because there is still this intense effort. Yesterday, the United States Supreme Court allowed the state of Alabama uh, to prohibit curbside ballots for Let people. Let me just stop you. Let me just stop you for a second. Okay, so this is a case that LDF litigated. The decision came down last night. I'm mad as a, as a, as a hatter about it. And <laughs> you are right. I just want to say this about, you know, about the voting piece. What we are seeing right now is extraordinary in terms of people early voting and, you know, and, and demanding that they want to participate. But you are, I just want to put a fine point on this issue. We are talking about a 1964 issue, right? When we're talking, of, when we're at this level of talking about resistance to ensuring that people can vote and participate in the political process. And so I want to just underscore how important that is and the, how upsetting the decision was from Alabama, uh, from, from the Supreme Court last night about Alabama. 
and and you know underscore that that's kind of the the foundation of the whole thing. But okay, so definitely voting. Keep going. Definitely voting. And then it intersects, of course, with the criminal justice system because you know you have states like Florida, where yeah. there was a ballot initiative in 2018 where the question was asked: Should we allow people who are formerly incarcerated to get their voting rights back? And the overwhelming majority of people in the state said yes. In a society governed by the rule of law, everybody should have a, a voice in participating in that law. And so we thought, oh, great. And then what has happened over the last two years is strategy, the intense resistance to voting applied through the lens of the criminal justice system has been on dramatic display. And that's another example of one of the challenges that we are fighting in this region. But it's also worth stating, this is the region where the rates of incarceration are the highest. The Bureau of Justice uh, issued report uh, yesterday on uh, on sentencing in America. And of course, some states have had very small decreases in their prison population. States like Alabama, the prison population has increased in the last year. The COVID uh, crisis has impacted people in this region in a really tragic way. The mortality rate is five mm -hmm. times higher in jails and prisons than it is outside jails and prisons. I represent people who are serving life imprisonment without parole for simple possession of marijuana. Uh, for stealing a bicycle, for nonviolent property crimes. And there is this indifference to this phenomena. And, and I think this region is uh, shaping policy in other parts of the country. And so when we don't pay attention to the challenges that are created by our criminal justice system here, we've got thousands of people in jails and prisons, innocent for crimes, serving these extreme sons. Florida has no minimum age for trying a child as an adult. Think about that, no minimum age. I've mm -hmm. represented nine-year-old children in that state facing 50 and 60 years in an adult prison. We've got thousands of children in adult jails and prisons where they're being targeted for abuse and violence and all of these other things. Right, Brian, I'm gonna I'm stop you because we've got about five minutes left. Yeah. And I want us to talk about what we want, Yeah. right? So if yeah. you had to bullet three things, and I know there's a debate happening later tonight and so um, and people are going to be already stressed and upset. So let's leave on if, if, if we had the opportunity for, let's say, three pieces of legislation or three initiatives or just three things that you think would be critical to happen, you know, beginning in January, yeah. um, you know, what, what would those three things be? I think the first would be declare an end to the war on drugs and redirect the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested in drug task forces and prosecuting people who have essentially a health problem and treating it as a crime problem. To end that, get those people out of our jails and prisons and begin redirecting the billions we'll save into communities where we can actually build healthy responses to addiction and dependency. That would be number one. Okay. Number two, we're going to have to repair the interpretations of the law that have have, have been uh, amassing over the last decade that create new barriers. So we can't actually adequately protect people in jails and prisons. We can't actually get innocent people out of jails and prisons. We can't actually prove innocence. We can't. So we're going to have to repair those laws. And there are a set of those laws that I think we can identify. I think that should happen in the first six months, because oftentimes we're told, well, you have to wait. Criminal justice has to wait. We can't wait. Mm -hmm. and then the third thing is that we have to commit at the national level to a truth-telling commission, the kind of truth-telling that will allow all of the stuff that we've been talking about to be endorsed by a Congress, by a president that recognizes that this is the moment in American history when we're going to end the silence and begin engaging in the kind of uh, critical work that will create a different future. I think all three of those things would be at the top of my list. Okay, here's my three. So I'm gonna say that number one, we need the national legislation. We already have one passed the House, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that is going to transform uh, the, the way in which we engage policing in this country from the federal level on down, give us some real tools to bring about accountability. There's a lot of work happening at the local level and that's critically important, but you need this overlay to change this infrastructure that, has, that we currently have that is not working and can't be reformed. It needs this new legislation. Number two, we need this voting legislation that is now, I've become more ambitious. I used to say I just needed a Shelby fix. Now the voter suppression that we've seen over the last several years, we have to really think about an omnibus voting bill that will restore the power to the people so that people can actually express themselves and have some control over their communities. There does need to be this massive investment uh, in our communities. 
and looking at a kind of an omnibus, a, a Marshall plan for black communities. And by Marshall, I mean Thurgood Marshall plan for black <laughs> communities that covers every single area that we need to be able to deal with um, educational infrastructure, uh, jobs, physical infrastructure, housing, and so forth. It is past time to do it. We can do it. We find the money to do whatever we want to do when we want to do it. And it's time to find the money to absolutely do this. And I know that we can. So Brian, I'm so thrilled that you were able to have this conversation uh, with me. You know, it's always too short. It goes too fast. Um, but I, I feel that it's important at this moment for us to um, express our dedication to continuing the fight. People are tired. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been incredibly difficult for all of us. We are going to be facing the consequences of it, particularly the Black community and the Latino community. But I feel that um, I'm, I'm rededicating myself uh, every day to this fight because of the people who came before us who wor worked in such intolerable conditions to create what has been possible for you and for me um, and for many others. And to try to just draw on a fraction of their courage a yeah. fraction of their determination. It wasn't because they saw what the end of the race was going to be. They couldn't know, uh, but they believed they had enough faith. They had enough dedication to keep moving forward and to keep trying to make change. They didn't get to make all the change they wanted to make, but they made enough change that made some things possible, including the life and work that you and I are able to do. And I think we owe it uh, to them, but also to those uh, young people who are out protesting to the children that you all are that you are representing the nine-year-olds the kids who are uh, now in zoom school we owe it to them to create a future uh, that has some possibility and opportunity for them to live lives of dignity and so I remain committed to this work I know you do too um, if you have any last words you want to say before you say goodbye to everybody please do well, just thank you for the work that LDF is doing. Thank you for the work uh, that has to happen and continue to happen. And I just want to echo what you say. I, you know, I, I live in Montgomery and I know I'm standing on the shoulders of people who did so much more, but so much less. And I'm constantly reminded of that. And, and it's been interesting to have this moment where I think about my great grandfather who was enslaved, but learned to read even while he was enslaved because he believed one day he'd be free. And that's so irrational and how he gave that love of reading to my grandmother. And she gave it to my mother, her youngest of 10 kids, and she gave it to me. Those were acts of hope and love that lifted me up, lifted us up. And I just understand more and more why people would sing, we shall overcome when they were oppressed and challenged and beaten and battered. And I feel the need to sing that too. I think we shall overcome. I'm not dissuaded. Someday, someday. Someday, that's right. And that's what we have to use and hold on to. They gave us that song for moments just like this. And I just want to keep singing it. And but more than that, I want to live it and fight for it and implement it with all the things that I have before me. So I'm excited, even though I'm worried and challenged, I'm excited about what we can yet do to make justice real in this country. Listen, people, get your chairs, get your water, make sure that you vote, make sure that you stay safe. Um, know that you can reach out to us if you uh, find issues voting at the Legal Defense Fund. Uh, there's a civil rights election protection number, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. If you have trouble uh, voting or trouble at the polls, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. And you can also sign up and volunteer to do work at the polls with the Legal Defense Fund. And you can learn everything you need to know about voting at our microsite, voting.naacpldf.org, voting.naacpldf.org. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Hold on. <laughs>